Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the podcast today, we have Keith Fraser. Keith, welcome. Thank you for having me, Thomas. Nice to be with you. It's my pleasure. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, listen, I could probably talk for hours, as I often do do, but um, I'm a bit of a polymath. I've been involved, and I still am, involved in property. I'm a qualified chart surveyor as well, uh, general practice valuation surveyor. I have been, uh, I run my own property portfolio. I, over the years, I've been involved in hard sales. Uh, I've been involved in entertainment, comedically, musically, politically, if you like. And it all came under one banner when, when it kind of dawned on me that um, I guess I'm quite a ballsy type of personality and a bit of a, a bit of a prankster as well. And um, I decided to put it under one banner called Cajonas, which is the Spanish slang for balls. Uh, it, isn't gen- it is not gender specific before you even cut in and maybe say that. But um, ideally, it's about being gutsy, being audacious, being fearless, unapologetic, and authentic. That's the kind of name of the game. Um, you know, I, I realise that, that we live in a society where even from, even from family, when we grow up, parental uh, messages, peer messages, societal messages means you can't say this, you can't be that, you can't do that. This book is about proverbially sticking proverbially sticking two fingers up at um convention doing what you want being what you want and saying what you need and not being afraid to do so well a couple of um things i wanted to follow up on the first thing was the only thing i was going to cut up uh, cut in and say was um also known as co jones right well it's spelt co jones uh, my mum would call it co jones it's but like no, more of an that, inside um, yes, joke. That is how it's, yeah, it is a kind of inside joke. I don't know where you, where, you, where you heard that one, but yeah, it is a kind of inside joke because my mum says that. And actually, many people don't know how to spell the words, so it kind of helps them spell it. So uh, your listeners will be able to know, you know straight away, oh, I, uh, I know how you spell that. Well, that's how you spell the Spanish word cojones, or as we in England would say, cojones, whatever. But yeah, that's the uh, the general thing. Well, the more serious follow-up is, um, do you make a distinction between, um, because I think you're, correct me if I'm wrong, your work is about um, not allowing limitations to be put on yourself um, by you firstly, and then also by others versus just controversy. So I think a lot of people who maybe take this my my opinion maybe take it too far when they're just doing things to be to getting reactions out of people whereas the other side of that is i'm not going to let someone dictate what i say and that's going to make me better as a person and in my business for example what are your thoughts on that well i i i I genuinely believe we live in a world today where people are frustrated you know we just seen over the weekend people rioting in bristol and and over the last year, people, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, for some good reason, we've had some some demonstrations. But you know, we're all, I think, people are frustrated, and I think the reason people are very frustrated is because we are told what we can't do all the time, what we shouldn't do, and I think if people were more authentic, if people were able to do what they want, say what they need, be what they want without judgment without caring about judgment, I think people will be a lot happier and I think the world will be a happier place. Well, there's one um, thing that I did want to ask you about, which was um, you said that you wanted to discuss being uh, utterly authentic. And um, if it's the case that people do find themselves, um, their speech being regulated, if you like, about their thoughts and whatnot, um, if they are in that position, um, what would you recommend they do if they, if they didn't want that to be the case? So what are some principles that you would advise them to do if, if they wanted to be utterly authentic? Well, uh, in my book, which I don't know if you've got a copy, but it's called Kahana's Grow Up Hair for Success. It's cheekily titled, but it's profound. 
And one of the things that I have penned are the Kahuna's Ten Commandments, which is slightly tongue in cheek, but but with a, with a, a with a real depth to it. And it, and it goes according to some of the things that we've said just now. We said, you know, one of them is say it how, how it is. End political correctness. It's simply lying. You know, be a shepherd, not a sheep, uh, et cetera. There's, there, uh, even I forget, I forget them, to be honest with you. I can bring them up for you. Throw the dice and play. Don't rip up the rule book. Burn it instead. So I think that because we learn that we have to fit in, Everything about about parenting, schooling, a lot of it is about fitting in. And you look at all the all the most successful people who've actually left the kind of legacy in the world, or people alive today, they haven't necessarily fitted in because they've gone against that grain. If you didn't have people like, for example, Steve Jobs, who came out with the iPhone, which was utterly evolution uh, revolutionary at its time uh, you wouldn't we, we probably wouldn't be talking now because it probably wouldn't be a podcast uh, scenario alexander graham bell who invented the phone uh, people even and, and many people are actually derided when they're alive for some of their very interesting new thoughts and ideas like gaudi who uh, is, is famous obviously in spain and a lot, of his, a lot of his work was absolutely mocked. But now you go to Spain or go to Barcelona and people go specifically to visit his work. So, um, sorry, I'm going on. What was the question again, Thomas? It was about helping people um, to be authentic when there's external pressures on them to be like everyone else. Well, you, there are a number of things to that because obviously people... I, I believe everyone wants to be authentic, but people are scared to be. Uh, one of the things is, is fear. I mean, there are times when you are up at yourself, but uh, to be authentic, you have to throw away the change. You have to be willing to step up to the plate. You have to say what you feel. Now, I'm not saying going away, uh, around offending people. If you're in a job, you want to speak to your boss, step up to the plate, grow a pair, Say what you need, but you can use softeners. You don't have to go in there like a bull in a china shop. We well, all have the ability to open our mouths and to speak. And I think that there are many, many things that we can do in terms of doing what you want to do. If you've got an idea, okay, first of all, don't share it with the naysayers because they'll do their best to put you off. You've got to look, You first of all, you've got to think, is that an idea that I can do? Do your homework, as one of my Cajona's icons said in my book, Barry Hearn, the sports promoter, you've got to do your homework. He said, if you do your homework, you'll pass the exam. That doesn't mean every, every idea is going to come to fruition. But when I, what I think he meant by passing the exam is meaning that you've left no stern unturned in order to go from A to B. There's no guarantee that it will succeed, but you've done everything in your power to make it so. That will be something that will live with you because most people look back and think to themselves, oh, if only I would have done that. But how many people will look back and say, oh, I did that. What, that was a failure. The worst thing you can do is to not have a go. Mm. It's worse to, um, to not try than it is to fail, right? Well, the biggest failure is the failure to try. Mm. But then again... There's a very interesting thing. If I said to you, Thomas, obviously for your listeners, we can see each other. We're doing this on Zoom. If I said to you, try and lift your arm. Go on, this, try and lift um, your arm. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, try and lift your arm. That's lifting no, you your arm, your right? Arm. You lifted your arm, right? So you can't really try. You either do it or you don't. This is and one of your the, skills of being a NLP practitioner, right? Well, I don't know about that. Listen, I've studied NLP. I don't like to consider myself in any shape or form a guru. I've amassed a, 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 um, a set of, I think, what is fairly unique way of looking at things, a, a way of living. Amongst other things, I've studied NLP, transactional analysis. I've obviously been in hard sales. I know what it takes to communicate, to persuade, to entertain. 
So really, it's just an amalgam of my experiences. But um, but no, I, I, I think that these are very, very wise things to do. At the end of the day, when we were kids, people say to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? We've all got these dreams. But they are almost surgically removed from, from us as we, as, uh, as we mature. That can't be a good thing. Why are they surgically removed, metaphorically speaking? Because we're told, oh, you can't do that. You're not clever enough for that. Oh, you shouldn't do that. How about, okay, do your homework, see if you can pass the exam, or you will pass the exam. Whether it works out or not, I don't know. But how about that attitude? One thing I like um, to quote, I believe it was by Tim Ferriss, which is um, test, your test your assumptions. So, um, you know, rather than saying I can't do something or allowing someone else to tell you you can't do something, just test it and find out. Well, yes, but of course, uh, and like I said, one of the, the things that I talk about in my book, for example, I interviewed a number of what I call Kahuna's icons, people who've been ballsy in different fields. I don't know if you were going to ask me this, but they don't have to be people you like, but I've interviewed people who were ballsy in different areas. One of the guys, one of the first guys I wanted to speak to was a guy called David Walsh. He's the chief sports writer of the Sunday Times. He's effectively responsible for bringing Lance Armstrong down effectively after the cheating scandal for many, many years. This is a guy at Cajonas in the name of integrity, speaking out. He had many, many naysayers. He had many people who almost gave him the cold shoulder because they didn't want to hear the truth. But he carried on. Other people, people, as I said, like Barry Hearn, who's got his, is a ballsy entrepreneur. As he said, he said, I've got ideas. Some of them I don't go forward with. I just do my homework and I leave no stone unturned. And once I've done that, I see whether it's, it, it, that risk has been calculated enough for it to go forward. Other people, people like Chris Eubank, as an example, people who've had the balls to be different, to be themselves. He's been mocked tremendously throughout his life, the way he dresses, the way he speaks. But there have also been many people who've applauded him and put him up on a pedestal because of the fact that he feels comfortable enough to be himself and to be different. I interviewed Nigel Farage. He's not necessarily a character that everybody likes, but he, whether you like it or not, has made a massive change to the complexion of British politics in this country. If it hadn't been for him, we wouldn't be out of the EU, for, for better or for worse. And um, this is a guy who had a vision. He's been derided over many years, but his vision was so strong, he kept at it non nonstop and saw it through to the end. So those are the people I think also in any type of nation, if you want to become more ballsy in any approach, in life, be that in business, in relationships, whatever, look at the people you can model. Look at how they do it. What are they doing? What is their mindset? It will help you and will give you the opportunity to employ some of those ways into your own life and your own uh, situation and context that you need it for. Well, I was going to mention the show reel because I think it's great. And it, um, I think anyone should, uh, should go look at it just for the entertainment value. Um, but you mentioned in it that you don't put the celebs on uh, a pedestal, but on the same level as you. Um, how, what's the, the philosophy behind that? Like yourself, Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong. If, I, if you cut, you bleed. You started up from the womb, you'll end up in the grave, I'm afraid to say. We all will. It's not an easy thought, I know. My point is, we're all the same. And, you know, I, I could, for example, I, I, just, I did it when I, when I got these people to come on my YouTube channel for the purpose of writing a book. Uh, I phone them direct. Now, I know many people find that difficult because they think, oh, you're picking up the phone to such and such. You've built this kind of thing in your mind of how great they are, this perception of how they're going to react. But the truth is, they're no different to me and you. They may have done some, some good things. They may have done some bad things. But they're human beings. They're human. 
And I just don't see them any better than you or I. In fact, I know that to be the case. And in fact, some of them may have made a lot of money. Some of them may have made a difference in the world of politics or in the world of whatever it may be. Well done to them. But at the end of the day, they're human. And I don't see any reason why I can't go up to somebody and speak to them. If you put Donald Trump in front of me now, I would not be intimidated. Because the guy, some may say he's inhuman, but he is still flesh and bones like me and you. And I just think we put too many people up on a pedestal. Our perceptions and thoughts about how great someone is. It's, it's, it's all perceptions and thoughts. Once you put clear the perceptions and thoughts out of the way, who are they? They're just human beings. I don't, I don't, I don't see any problem picking up the phone to anybody. And nor should you. So um, the, because I, I know that it's one of the things which I think with everyone wanting to have a podcast, one of the things which uh, I know that people would want to ask you is how did you get these people or how did you interview like lots of influential people and basically, it's just picking up the phone. Is that pretty much the end of it? <laughs> well, that's pretty much it. I have to say, I'm not a fan of agents. They are, are the gatekeepers. And, and I've been in a sales world. And any businessman who listens to this podcast will know that you have to, uh, any businessman knows you have to, you have to pick up the phone and speak to the decision maker. Not the PA, not anybody else, the decision maker. They're the ones who write the checks, in, uh, metaphorically speaking. And, I always, and, and I've learned that from the sales, when I was doing telephone sales, speak to the decision maker, if you can. So I use certain ways of trying to get hold of the telephone numbers for the people I want to interview, which I fortunately was able to do. People know people who know people, and I phoned them up and I pitched them direct. And that's the way I did it. It's not easy. Sometimes you get the cold shoulder. Sometimes it takes a long time and a lot of persistence because they're, some of them are very busy. But uh, at the end of the day, it's like I always say, in any form of sales. I mean, if you were going to ask a girl, or I don't know, maybe even a boy out, in, uh, <laughs> depending on one's sexual persuasion. But if you're going to ask a girl out, would you phone the friend up and ask them? Well, it wouldn't be advisable. You don't go through the agent. You go to the, the person who makes the final decision. And that's the crux of it. Yeah. And it's about what's in it for them, right? You have to be able to construct a pitch. You have to make it sound sexy and make it sound interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I know at the end of the day, what's in it for them? Sometimes people like speaking. Some people like to be in, to engage. Some people like to feel that they are important enough that you want to hear them, hear, hear what they've got to say. It all depends. But ultimately, once you create the story, create the need, um, obviously you've got to be prepared. But all I'm saying is, however you do it, don't go to a third party if you can help it. Have you got a particular story that, um, or a call that you would like to share in terms of uh, a person that you spoke to and how that conversation went? In, in what? In getting them to interview them? Yeah. No, you put me on the spot there. Um, well, it's interesting actually, because as essentially one of the first people I was really keen to interview, he's not as high profile as some of the others, was David Walsh. And um, I'm not going to say how I managed to get his number, but I phoned him up, I pitched him. I had to pitch him a few times. And I remember him asking, because why should I be interviewed by you? <clears throat> I said, look, you are somebody who, would, who is held up by people as an unbelievably gutsy, principled man. And I think that your message is so important for people to hear. People want to know how they can employ some of your guts, some of your integrity into their own lives. That's exactly why I, I think it's important for you to come on, because it's an important message for people to take into the world. 
and it was convincing enough for him to 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 come on. Um, you kind of put me on the spot there, Thomas. I have many stories, believe me, many stories. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm quite persistent. Um, I did an event not long ago with Arsene Wenger. I don't know if you're a football fan. That was hard. That was hard because the guy is seriously, seriously busy. He didn't respond to texts. He didn't call me back. He did call him back a couple of times, but trying to pin him down. We did a charity event with him and we could have sold out the Palladium. But the truth is, he only I only managed to get his confirmation uh, less than two weeks before the event. So we went for a smaller venue. We still sold out within 48 hours and it was great to have, for me to interview him and put him in my book because he's a man who has... Well, he's, got, he, he's a ballsy guy in terms of implementing his ideas, shutting out all the terrible critics that he had to endure during the latter half of his, of his uh, managership at Arsenal. But um, very interesting guy and somebody, a very wise person who one can learn from. Well, uh, the first part of your answer, I felt like, you know, everyone's getting a sales lesson now. Like we're learning about how to, uh, how to sell properly. And uh, the, the second part, um, in terms of the, uh, am I a football fan? I used to go and see Wimbledon FC. So I'm sure you've followed uh, football for a long time. So it's a, it's a sensitive subject, am I a football fan? Well, for what it's worth, I went to Plough Lane many, many years ago to see Arsenal play. It was the first game of the season in 1988. I think Arsenal won 5-1 at Plough Lane. But anyway, I won't rub it in. Plough Lane is really going back some. There are, there are some people I'm sure haven't heard of Plough Lane. But, um, aren't they really, uh, haven't, are they back at Plough Lane now? Uh, well, I don't, I don't follow the, the team anywhere anymore because um, oh. it's kind of like my, my team <coughs> was at Sellers Park and then it kind of went into two separate, two separate teams. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um, I digress. What does it mean to be audacious? Well, to be audacious, wow, that's an interesting question. What does it mean to audacious? I'm not going to give you the, the Oxford Dictionary meaning. I like the idea of the word, I, I would describe it as, as the, the Yiddish word chutzpah. Are you familiar with that word? I'm only familiar with that word because I did my homework by watching your interviews. But do go oh, on anyway. So I, I, interviewed, I interviewed Judge Rinder, and he said to me, chutzpah to him... And he made a very kind of, if you like, a, a black or doc joke out of it. Black humour, dark humour. Hope I'm not being uh, politically correct here uh, in saying that. But he said he imagined, he likened it to uh, murdering, murdering uh, your parents and claiming the family estate, which was a very OTT kind of way of saying it. What it is is outrageous cheek. Outrageous cheek. It's interesting, just to give you an idea. It is tongue-in-cheek, but I'll give you an idea. Uh, I remember there's a very interesting book, which I would re definitely recommend you reading and your listeners, called Influence by Roberto Chiaudini. And there was a very interesting experiment about the power of the word because. And I think it was somewhere where, where people were lined up in a, in, a, in a university to use the photocopy machine. And people, they did this, they did this experiment and they went up to the people at the front, but the people at the back, you went up to the person at the front and said, excuse me, can I use the photocopying machine? Most people, a lot of people said no, because they've waited for ages. But then they tried something different. They said, excuse me, can I use the photocopy machine because I need to make a copy? And the number increased considerably because of they used the word because. It's almost like a some kind of uh, stimuli that enable them to say, okay, they didn't. Now I tried something even similar. I went to uh, King's Cross Station. Uh, we had a camera, we didn't actually put it out, but it was an interesting experiment. We went completely OTT. There was, a, there was queues for the tickets. And uh, I, was, I went up to the front of the, the, the people at the queue and said, excuse me, do you mind if I just quickly jump in because my cat's at home barking? I kid you not. People didn't even think when they let me go in front of them and, and buy a ticket. 
Now, I'm not saying recommending you do that, but that is the notion of outrageous audacity. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting you should be underhand or anything, but audacity is having the the guts to really go for it, to be cheeky and, um, you know, to be audacious in your thoughts, to be lavish in your thoughts and your thinking and harnessing what you need to go for it. So audacity, I would, I would like it to chutzpah, which is outrageous cheek, perhaps, but it takes confidence and it takes cojones to be able to employ that. But I can tell you something. Many people in business have needed that quality in order to succeed. I can assure you. Whether that be our, our, uh, phoning the, the I'll, give you an, I'll, give, I'll give you another uh, story. I interviewed the show business agent, Jonathan Shallett. He told me that he was looking for a job when he was much younger and he knew where the boss of this company's office was. So he went to the window cleaner who he saw it was regularly cleaning the, win the, the window of this CEO. He said, can you put this letter on his desk? Because the window cleaner was cleaning this guy's at the CEO's window. He put the letter on his desk. That outrageous audacity got in the job. You know, I have often said to, to, to students, like when you go for a job interview, have you ever been for a job interview, uh, Thomas, where they say to you, is there anything you'd like to ask, ask us? Well, well I, I often, I often say, yeah, I would question. often say, yeah, well, I would often say, well, yes, when can I start? <laughs> that's, our, that's audacity. Some people may not like it, but that is what that I think that little bit of extra cheek could sometimes win you win win you deals and win you win you jobs. Well, something um, I look for when I'm hiring is certainly how keen they are. And if someone asks that question, I mean, it, it does show a level of keenness, right? Yeah, that does show a level of keenness, but it also shows a level of go getting. Mm. which depending on what industry you're in, I, for me, will be something, hmm, that's cheeky. Okay, I like your style. So can I ask a bit about your story? Um, how you started talking about uh, this topic? Um, you got your book and you're a speaker. And um, I'd just like to little, know a little bit about how you got to this place, really, if that's okay. Look, I, I've been on my own journey myself. When I was a kid, I didn't have good self-esteem. I had a sick father from the age of seven till he died. He was very sick. I was at home looking after my mum. And I was, my self-esteem was, was, was very low. I knew, I, and I couldn't, didn't understand what was wrong with me. And um, when I did a degree, I don't know if, I, if you know this story, but when I did a degree, when I went to go and get my results on the, on the final year we went up to college up to the uni and I got a reasonable degree of 2-2 and my immediate thought was how did I fluke that never ever did it occur to me that actually I had a modicum of intelligence mm. modicum of ability um, but the, and, and yet the bizarre thing is I've never failed an exam I've always succeeded pretty much in most things I've done to some degree done many things I've performed in front of crowds martial arts I was successful at number uh, you know music and only I guess when I hit 30 did I think actually Keith you have some ability you have got something I never realized it. And I obviously went on a journey of, if you like, personal development. I guess I was one of those self-help junkies. I mean, I read it, uh, I bought every single book under the sun. Nothing ever worked because there was never, there was always a book out there that was going to give me the answers. But you know what, Thomas, I'm still looking for the answers really, aren't we all? And through my study, and I have studied a lot of psychology. I studied a lot of influence. Like I said, I was in, in telephone sales. If you've got any kids, which I think you mentioned you do, if there's one thing I would always want my kid to have expertise in, 
sales because then you will never go hungry. And I'm a strong believer in that. And what, and, and I've, I've been in the sales office where many people fail. Many people can pitch, but they can't close. Many people are scared to, scared to pick up the phone. I, I, I believe that I have some innate ballsiness, which I couldn't put my finger on. But what I have, if you like, amassed using a lot of the learnings and the experiences over my life and that's all been formed in the book and I believe that the book will show you the why you need this quality and the how you can achieve it. So what were you selling when you first took on your sales job? Yeah I, I used to sell advertising space to banks around the world at ten thousand dollars a page okay. and it's funny I, I, I don't like to kind of blow my own trumpet but I was the number one salesman the bizarre thing was I always felt I was only as good as my next deal. So I was always felt pressured to have to go out and constantly prove myself. Um, but it was a good ground. It was great grounding. Like I said, it has probably helped. I've always had the ability to pick up the phone to people. Like I said, I used to be a bit of a telephone prankster. So we used to do that. And actually when I was at college, I used to do telephone sales as well, uh, part time. But I think, uh, it's such a it's such an important quality for any anyone going into the workforce to have. If you can sell, and you know how and you know how to sell well, you're always going to be of value to anyone. There's an interesting fear around picking up the phone, and I think if you get thrown into that environment where you just have to do it day in day out, it's it just comes very natural after a while, doesn't it? For some, but as I said, I've been in the sales office where the turnover of staff is unbelievable because the amount of people who could just, just can't do it. Mm. You'd be surprised how many people are fearful, how many people who, who don't want to ask for the deal. And there's all sorts of reasons I can go into. One of the reasons is because it means so much. If you, if, if, if you, if you weren't desperate to sell, the level of importance you place in it will be less. It's a bit like in tennis. I, I do a tennis podcast, Rock and Roll Tennis with uh, John Lloyd. And I was talking about it the other day. On match point, why is it a lot of people double fought? Because all of a sudden the meaning of that point becomes so vivid. But if you focus on the process, i.e. doing up to that point and not on the meaning behind it your the nerves and the fear and your ability to perform will be enhanced so you were um you did sales during your degree and then also after um how did how long did you stay in the uh selling advertising and what did you do after that well i i i I qualified, I did an urban estate management degree, and then I was training as a chartered surveyor. I came out of that, and I had a conference company, and then I went to work for, went to work for another conference company who also had this publishing arm. Um, and then I got back into property. I still am in property. Um, I think, for me, it's one of the best forms of investment. Well, it's the one I know most of. But, uh, yeah, in hard sales... Full time, I was in that for I think four or five years. I think um, regarding the property stuff, does that allow you to? Is that like a main part of your business activity? It, it is because I always consider that your bread and butter. Okay. Uh, I still advise some clients, but I also am um, doing stuff, some speculative stuff, which I hope is. I like the idea of building something. It's almost like a feeling of security like um, a foundation and all the other stuff that I, I do is if you like the icing. Mm. Well, you mentioned, um, but we always oh, like to eat the icing, don't we? <laughs> uh, some people just like the icing. Um, you mentioned exactly. hard sales um, there. Are, I, I don't think that has a good reputation. So um, what, what um, doesn't hard sales? Right. What's your definition? Of the reason I sales? call it hard sales, Thomas, is because phone. It, because when you're doing cold calling over the phone, 
that's why I would say it's hard sales because you're phoning cold. You're selling air effectively. It's not like you're in a car show and you're showing a, an actual product that is salient, touchable, feelable, drivable. It's you're selling space. So in a way, it's got to be a very good sale to get anywhere because you are selling effectively air, space. So it's tons uh, of space around. It's a, another way of putting it for people who have take issue with that term is prospecting, basically. Is that fair? People don't like prospecting, you're saying? Uh, I'm saying um, the for people who, who don't like the term hard sales or take issue with that term, basically you're saying prospecting, cold sales. Yeah, cold sales. I mean, it, it, maybe I say hard sales because it's a hard sell. It's hard. <laughs> it's not easy. You know, people go into, in, in, into a car showroom, they're what you would call warm leads. But if you're phoning up someone cold, yeah, it's hard. That's why I probably call it hard. But yeah, it's, it's um, they're not warm leads. Mm. So, so you're you going off, you, 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 you're going off from a, from a, from, you don't have an, you don't, you're not hitting the ground running, so to speak. Mm. So you're in your property business. You're doing pretty well, presumably. What, um, leads you to what's the catalyst for cojones what happens um that allows you to get into that space well i guess if you like property has been the catalyst because that's my foundation which has given me a stuff to go out and preach what i believe is a very important message and it's a message that i'd like my boy to take on my son because i think that if you go into the world fearful hold you back if you go in there fearless but calculated they are two very very powerful ingredients fearless and calculated you need to be fearless why because there are many people out there who will try and put the wind up you and prevent you doing what you need to do including your own mind we all have negative talk we need to overcome and then you need to calculate. So if you calculate, it's a bit like Sarah Willingham, the Dragon's Den star who I interviewed. She said to me, what I tend, she tends to do is she looks at what she needs to do. If the collateral damage isn't that great, she goes for it. That is calculated fearlessness. And I think they are two very, very, if they're anything, the two most important ingredients. For example, there are a number of qualities of the icons of Cajolas that I've managed to identify. That can be focused, conviction, and the ability to ride criticism, the ability to have a go, the ability to play, being a force, having energy, an energy and chutzpah. And you need to find out what your motivation is. If you are like Nigel Farage, for example, his motivation was he was utterly convinced that the whole notion of leaving the European Union. You may say it was wrong. So may I. But he had this force, he had an energy and a conviction that was so powerful that he was unable to harness the qualities of the of cojones to go for it and to continue going for it, despite the naysayers trying to stop him in his, in his tracks. So I would say fearlessness and calculation are two things that are very, very, if you like, the crux. Mm -hmm. And um, does NLP help you with this process? And at what point did you decide to become a practitioner of it? Again, always inter inter interested in the power of communication, the power of persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider NLP the pan panacea for everything, but it has some very interesting tools. Uh, there are certain things, for example, if you want to get yourself into a state a telephone sales, as an example, to pick out the phone to someone you perceive as somebody on a high level, which they're not, but you can you will perceive it. There are certain tools you can use, like anchoring, which are certain stimuli you can train yourself to have, which get you into a resourceful state, calm, confident, whatever it may be. Very useful tools to have. There are also a number of linguistic situations, like for example, if you're if you're if you tell yourself, oh, I always mess it up. 
the neurolinguistic in neurolinguistic meta model, one would say always. Ah, oh, maybe not always. There are a number of different linguistic models where you can question, which enable you to realize something different, which is fantastic because it gets you into the a different uh, frame of thought to enable you to take a different course of action and one not of refrain. So these tools are very, very useful. But again, I've topped it up with my own Kahana's Ten Commandments, which I think if you adhere to, will make you a very more authentic, very much more authentic and more successful person in life. And of course, the ability to focus in on Kahona's icons. And those icons can be anyone you want to look at. People who've been ballsy in their particular field. And you can say, what is it that they've done? How have they done it? What's been going in, in, in their mind? Once you can gauge that, these are all useful things to learn. And we all learn from others anyway. Would you say that you've got some mentors um, that have helped you learn these principles? And would you also refer to them as mentors? My wife's a mentor because I'm not always uh, in the frame of mind. She helps. I've got another guy who was always mentoring me, who understood the way I tick. I think it's important to have mentors. Most people have family, but if you haven't got family, there's often people out there who can be good mentors. And I think it is useful, but the biggest mentor you need is yourself. And again, a lot of the things that I espouse in the book will give you all that you need to not need anything external. Because at the end of the day, um, the world is inside out. It comes from within. We, all, we, 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 we have to be accountable for ourselves. And my book is about personal accountability. That's why many, there'll be many people who won't like it. As Barry Hearn said, I can't remember what he said. He's given me a very nice testimony, but he said, this book is not for anyone who likes to sit on the fence. And many people would, would, would not like the book because it's about personal accountability. And many people don't want to be personally accountable. They want to blame something external. They don't want to look at themselves. Do you mind yeah. if I ask about your what your goals are, both in business and then also for the book? And many of the things in the book are out of my control. I personally, I would like to create a meme where people it's suddenly on people's lips to, to, to live the cojones way. Because I think... You can't change the world, you can change yourself only. But if you start that way and other people follow suit, then the world will be a happier place as well. So I would love to see the book become like a meme, like a some kind of some, something that people almost say to each other, grow up here, get yourself in the cojones. People are using your logo. Right. That's what I would like. But yeah, well, I would love to see people out there on the streets wearing a hat, wearing a T-shirt. And it, and, and it takes on so people actually learn that this is a, life, life, a lifestyle and a code for living that actually is worth it. And, um, of course, it may, it may not, again, be to everyone's liking. It may not be to those who don't want to say what they want to say because they still want to tread on eggshells. I say, no, we don't want to tread, tread on eggshells. We want to, we want to live life authentically. So my, 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 of course, I'd like the book to sell millions of copies. Who knows? Maybe it will. I think it's, it, I think it should, of course, naturally. And business wise, I, I'm just obviously continuing to, to work in the property side, do some more speaking when things open up. And I'm also doing the podcast. I'm doing a lot more, a lot more of that, likewise. But I do a, a tennis podcast, and I'm also looking at launching a podcast based around my theories, which I want to be a mixture of fun and learning, profound learning. Is there anything that you feel would be of value to the listener that we haven't talked about today? <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting one. Just take a long, hard look in the mirror and say to you, and, and look at yourself and think, 
Am I living life on my terms? Or am I living to please somebody else or society? And if you're not living life on your terms, start growing a pair. <laughs> start living the Cajonas code, and I promise you, you will do. That's such a quote moment. Um, where is the best place to find you? Keith Fraser. So you can email me at Keith at cojones.biz or as my mother would say, Keith at cojones.biz. You could go to the website or the book Cojones Grow a Pair for Success is available on Amazon, Waterstones, etc. And if you don't like it, feel free to email me, tell me why. But I would say most people who have read it, I've been on national radio a few times and the presenters have loved it. And I'm happy to say the response is great. And I feel certain that you will pick up one or two pieces of wisdom that will, that will help, help you, you know, in, in the future. I'm just now, interested to know if someone actually does email you and say that they don't like it what would your response be well i'd say you're warm and welcome to have your opinion okay that's what it's about i'd be curious to know why please elaborate but that's absolutely fine if you don't believe it if you don't like it like i said uh it takes all sorts to make a world and i'm not one of these people who would be offended if you didn't like it because you know what? It's like this um, showbiz agent said to me, he said, when Ricky Gervais says there's millions of people who don't like him, he said, I'm just, but he said he focuses on all the millions of people who do like him. So in the same way, it's half, glass half full and glass half empty. Focus on the glass half full, I guess. Yeah, I can definitely see a lot of, uh, a lot of the self-development coming through. Um, Obviously, the message of uh, just sort of focusing on yourself, looking inward instead of looking outward um, is, is a powerful one. But I can see all the, um, all the self-development coming through. So I think it's a powerful message. And thank you very much for all the value you brought today. Well, with pleasure, Thomas. And I look forward to listening to your podcast. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be listening to the show from now on. Thanks a lot, Keith. Bring it on, Thomas. Bring it on. Speak to you soon.